Hello and welcome to Writers and Books Meet the BOA Authors series. I'm Kathy Serna, the Communications Associate here. For those, of, for those of you who are new to us, Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, a bookstore, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds. You can find more information at our website, wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions through the chat or Q&A function as well. Books are available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books, uh, and I'll make sure to put the link in the chat. Writers and Books would like to call attention to the complex and troubled history of the lands on which we live and work. We are hosting this event from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Onondaga, or the people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as the Seneca people, or the Keeper of the Western Door. We're so happy to have Jessica Q. Stark with us tonight. First, we'll hear her read, then she'll be in conversation with author and poet Peter Connors, publisher and executive director of BOA Editions. Told through personal, national, and cultural histories, Buffalo Girl is a feminist indictment of the violence used to define and control women's bodies. Jessica Q. Stark is the author of two full-length poetry manuscripts, as well as four poetry chapbooks, including her most recent, Render. Stark's first poetry manuscript, The Liminal Parade, was selected by Dorothea Lasky for the Double Take Grand Prize in 2016, and her full-length poetry collection, Savage Pageant, was named one of the best books of 2020 in the Boston Globe and Hyperallergic. Stark is a California native, mixed race, Vietnamese American poet, editor, and educator who lives in Jacksonville, Florida. She currently lives, oh, sorry, she currently serves as a poetry editor for Agni and um, the hybrid editor for Honey Literary. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. Thanks so much. I just want to say a quick thanks to everyone that um, is here. Um, thank you for all of the organizers um, for putting this together. I'm very excited uh, for this book to come out tomorrow. Um, a little bit sick right now, so just bear with me. I, I'll give a little context later, but I'm just gonna launch right into it. This is called Catalog of Random Acts of Violence. <clears throat> Where are you from? Where's your mother from? But can you speak it? Can she speak it? How long has she been speaking it? Are you better at reading or speaking it? Do you have family there? Do you think that you look like her? Where are they? Where are they now? Do people tell you that you look like her? Can you understand her? Can she understand me? How much Vietnamese is he? What do you think he looks like? Do you have another name? But can you cook it? When did she? Why didn't she? Why can? Why cannot? Um, this book is, uh, you know, it's dedicated um, deeply to my mother and um, dedicated to strong, complicated women. Um, it's also, uh, I was, when I was researching for this book, it's really indebted to uh, the lineage of the story of Little Red Riding Hood, um, the lineage of a story about a curious young girl um, that gets punished. And I was interested in ways of um, rethinking that. So this one's called Phylogenetics and it comes with an epigraph. <clears throat> there was a lonely cabin within a dark old wood and in it with her mother, there dwell Red Riding Hood. Phylogenetics. When it began isn't clear, but isn't it obvious that we always had a knack for stories about little girls in danger? Nice girls, stupid girls, naughty girls, girls bleeding and holding baskets of wine. Each not another route to pity blame the foul. Why not a hard edge? For once, let the girl wander where she pleases. For the moral of the story isn't always the same. And how's the one go where she doesn't die alone and pretty, where no huntsman comes around to cut her out? 
Who will answer for the anonymous limb taking? Where once a wood, a rice paddy. Where once a hole, a tooth. Songs of the Buffalo Girl, wet strands in a basket housing little figures that know their way around in the dark. Look now to Little Red Cap, taking all of her known objects to bed, taking off her overcoat to reveal fine downy fur. Give it up for, you know, complicated women. Um, this has images in it as well. I have a lot of collage work. This is an image of my mother um, shortly before she immigrated to the United States, um, juxtaposed with an image of um, the foliage where I live in Jacksonville, Florida. I was in this dreamy haze during um, pandemic lockdowns and I had just moved here and I was kind of obsessed with all the newness of, of the foliage that felt so violent and breathing and everywhere. And I couldn't stop taking photographs of it. <clears throat> so it leaked into this piece. I'll just read um, one of the erasures. There are several in this book. Little Red Hood. Once upon a time, a darling damsel said, I will observe the latch. And with that, everything looked so strange. Oh, how frightened I have been. It was so dark in the wolf's maw. Um, as I mentioned, this is really about you know my mother, but it's also about a lot of complex women across history. Um, so I'm just going to read two that speak to that. <clears throat> this one's called "Hungry Poem" with laughter coming from an unknown source. And the only thing you need to know about this is um, it takes a little from the mythology of the Chung sisters in Vietnamese. Um, mythology um, that is tethered to a kind of truth. It's like kind of a mythology around these two sisters that were warriors and um, they were resisting um, a kind of invasion of Han forces. And um, the rumor goes that instead of surrendering to the Han forces when it was clear that they were losing, they, um, they grasped hands and committed suicide jumping into a river together. Uh, or as, at least that's how it goes. So there's a reference to that in this poem. And this one's again, is called Hungry Poem with Laughter Coming from an Unknown Source. She's still there the further you look back. I mean, before the war and the wolves and the other war and the French and her departure and even the Chinese, I mean that way back. And since I'm talking about my mother, let's talk a hair down, cat-eyed perfection, heels on a borrowed Vespa kind of laughter, filling whole highways with her eyeliner, another kind of laughter, and a deep belly laugh at the thought of the Trung sisters ever jumping from a single thing besides the time it takes my mother to flip the switch on a boring conversation with a dick joke. What did she say? I mean, keep up. I mean, that far back when Vietnam knew a world could be best run by women and more women with still more laughter charging the void, a still life silt, a nitty knot of a lump in the throat, that sensation between choking and uncontrollable heaving laughter at the very thing that controls you and your body and your mother's body and my sisters. My dear sisters, we always had laughter for our bodies that kept planting deeper into the woods. Ground cover. Insert cut scene. Rescind the fairy tale. We all know there are no true villains. We're just a bunch of hungry animals. I would jump with you. I would. I would give it all for you. Laughter at sundown. Laughter at the feet crushing statuary. 
laughter until our very last word on this dying earth that just keeps turning and turning its silhouette shadow figures slipping back into human skin at dawn. I think I'm going to um, end on a longer poem. So bear with me. It's the last poem that I wrote for this book. And it was, I felt like there was a piece missing in the book for a long time. And so I snuck it in at the end and I'm really glad that I did. And it's called On Passing. Thank you for listening. On Passing. For years, I tried on different stories about my body to use the body as a rinsing husk. Language here is also a delicate pea pod, a shell that forms the world and its fantastic borders. For years, I ignored the sentence in my body, who came and who went, a blank ledger. In this, in this body is my mother's body who paid the fantastic price in fairy tales, mostly written by men. I have my mother's eyes and her teeth before they all fell out. I have a rare ring size around my tongue and to some, this is monstrous. She still speaks to me in Vietnamese, knowing that my lesson stopped nine years ago that nobody speaks it here. But I can still say, how are you? Happy birthday. I love you. This is a sufficient rind. This is the only way I can say, let's find a way out of here. Let's take apart the woods. The discomfort I have with my whiteness resembles betrayal to the sentence in my body. A short blade, an omission, a long tooth I can't extract. The second conditional clause sets a resting stone at the head of this long winded route. If I drank the wine, I wouldn't sleep well, so I never sleep. My whiteness makes some people comfortable. It provokes the most absurd confessions. A lot of people would like to hold me still, confess. Is there violence at the origin of each known word? I look up hybrid and arrive again to my wakefulness, afraid. The grammar of my body relies on certain conditionals. If it had never, if he hadn't asked, if the war wasn't, if the body had refused, if they hadn't, if the first time wasn't so, if there were fewer family members, if she hadn't wanted, if he hadn't fled, if it wasn't so, if the Americans weren't so, if she could stay still, my mother said when I was born, she was afraid. Women born in the year of the tiger are fabled as too much in their own story. They're risk takers in this world, which typically spells feminine ruin. She laughs often at her small monster leaping again into the dark. She was also afraid of the fourth scar. They said she'd be ripped apart between white walls. This country is not for the faint hearted. I will wear it. This is the sentence in my body, decorated. I cannot not take it off. I'm here because my mother settled a debt. There was a conditional in her body. There was a conditional in her father's body in a body of water. I am not frightened of risks, but I am afraid of drowning. I dreamed of it all year long before my son's first howl. My mother told me to name him twice to keep away bad spirits. I named him thrice and kept him low, tried to avoid his face. The typo on his birth certificate says gone. And with this, he looked satisfied. I paced around trying to figure out how to put him back in line. All night long, my bristles stood on fantastic ends. I meant to weep, but could only growl. You said nothing and brought back Panera to celebrate free coffee, a punch card, meal vouchers, white like paper, like my powerful calves. 
mm, yaga, yaga, all tongue and tooth, how jagged I felt those few weeks out, my story gone rogue, how without language, we might finally be vanished, touchless, free. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading those poems, Jess. So it's amazing to hear those in your voice. And congratulations on the book, which officially releases tomorrow. So we're right on the cusp of it. Okay. Um, I'd love to talk some about a Little Red Riding Hood. You mentioned um, that that plays largely into the book. And at the end, you have an appendix that collects different versions of the Little Red Riding Hood story from around the world. And at the end of those, you have um, sort of a moral summary, too, of what those messages are, you know, what those stories are sort of trying to convey. Um, so I'm curious, as you went through those, what are the most striking similarities and differences between the different versions you encountered? Sure, yeah. Um, well, as I was gathering, and this is just like the tip of the iceberg, there's, you know, dozens of other versions that I sort of played with and toyed with. I, I probably researched for about two years on any kind of version that I could find. Um, and I mean, for the most part, the commonality or the common thread um, that moves between all of them is that they begin with a curious girl who wanders away from instructions. Um, so I was really interested in that wandering. Um, I was interested also in it as being, you know, it predates written language. It's, it's one of the oldest stories passed down. Um, and I became really interested in like how, how it's had such a tenacious um, genealogy and how throughout that genealogy that spans centuries that it's always focused on the kind of um, a punitive morality tale around you know a young girl's curiosity or a young girl's wandering um, and of course it ends in many different ways but generally speaking she's she's seen as errant um, you know curious and um, disobedient in a lot of ways yeah I'm curious where um, where the writing of this book intersected with the Little Red Riding Hood narrative. So in other words, would there have even been a Buffalo Girl book without Little Red Riding Hood? Did that come into play once you were started going with the poems? Yeah, I think, um, well, I, I think I, I started first with the Little Red Riding Hood strand. Um, and I, you know, I'm a researcher by trade. I was, I was, you know, trained for a decade in scholarly research. And that's really where I get my creative impetus. Um, but then I had kind of recently spent a lot of time with my mother and a lot of these stories about her immigration, um, stories that I had never known before that she'd never revealed to me before um, in the last five years. And so I began kind of writing into that and it kind of just naturally coalesced in, in that you know, all of my research on, I knew I wanted to write something about around Little Red Riding Hood. And then thinking about the terms of my mom's de departure, you know, the fraught terms around how she arrived here, I just, it felt like a kind of wandering in itself. And I just, I couldn't help but keep those um, together in the same cosmos and began to write kind of um, collectively through those two threads that I, I couldn't keep apart. Yeah, and it's really, you know, there's so much mother-daughter dynamic in the book, and it's so central to the book. And I think having that laid next to the Little Red Riding Hood narrative, you know, at different times as a reader, I'd be like, oh, Little Red Riding Hood is more your mom. And then I'd say like, right. oh, no, Little Red Riding Hood is more, you know, you or the narrator, or however you want to say it. Um, and maybe that's not a fair, fair to even parse those apart, but do you have feelings about that or thoughts or your own take on that? Yeah, um, you know, like morphing and shape shifting is really important in this, um, in this story. And I also just like thinking about time, you know, like thinking about like why it took so long for my mom to tell me that like, you know, the details of her immigration and like a lot of, you know, these stories that are so tantamount to who she is and who I am and the terms of my own existence. Um, and that just came like really delayed in terms of our relationship to one another. And so time for me 
Um, like I wanted to think about like, you know, in the beginning I dedicated to her and all of the Buffalo girls thereafter, even though, you know, I reference so-called Buffalo girls and Vietnamese history and ancient history. And like, I wanted to toy with this idea of like, she did come before every, everyone else um, and kind of disrupt this linear thought of time um, within thinking about the story and thinking about the iterations of Little Red Riding Hood, which, you know, feel fractal and folding in on each other. And, you know, it also just, even the concept of this Little Red Riding Hood story fascinates me in that when you say that, everyone kind of has a familiar idea of what you're talking about, but yet like, you know, the maybe the ending that you remember today is different from the ending that you would remember tomorrow. Um, so it has like a very disruptive relationship to time in my mind and, and linearity and serial linearity. Um, so yeah, all to say that it was very much my obsession of, and you know, it's kind of related to um, my fascination of history in my first book too, but just how like reverberations of history continually impede on the present and perhaps vice versa. And you know, while we're talking about your mom, there's also photos you you showed one, and there's a photo of her on the cover, um, which I just absolutely adore that picture. That one and the one where she's sitting at a desk with her feet sort of kicked up yeah. on the drawer. It kills me every time. And then of course there's a photo, a beautiful photo of you two on the back of the book as well. Inside the book, most of the photos are parts of a collage. Um, so I'd love to hear some about, you know, your choice to not just use the straightforward photos, to use collage and what that adds to the book for you. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, another thing that I'm really, that I couldn't really get out from under is, um, this feeling of kind of trying to resist that this is, this is her story, or this is an accurate rendition, or this is truth. Um, I mean, it's, it's tethered to such, but it's also my, you know, it's inflected with my own perspective. It's inflected with how I'm thinking about Little Red Riding Hood. It's, inf it's inflected with maybe omissions that she didn't tell me, you know, it's inflected with white space um, in more ways than one. So I, for me, the collage is a way to be more visually accurate in terms of my embellishment of a rendition of my mother that perhaps isn't a full portrait of the fullness that she is, of which I, I, I'm i vexed and interested with the idea of this piece of her that I don't know and that I could never know, um, but yet I still so much deeply love her and understand her in deep ways. Um, so that for me, the, the collages were a way to sort of present a visual trace of my imperfection, my imperfect understanding of her and her story. Um, I wanted to physically leak myself into it. And you've used the term complicated a couple times in your reading too. And it's certainly, you know, you, you're, you, it complicates, complexifies the, the images themselves too. And it really opens them up to all these different uh, interpretations. I, I think it adds a ton to the, to the collection overall. And you talk about, um, you mentioned research as well and your background as a researcher. I think a lot of people think, you know, poetry and research do not go together. You know, one is creative and the other one is, is academic. And um, that's certainly not the case and particularly not with this book. So um, can you talk some about the, the interaction between research and maybe the more creative generative part of your writing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I spent uh, like about a decade in graduate school training to be a, a scholar and, and working a lot in older archives. I worked for a couple of years in the rare archives at Duke um, when I was finishing my PhD there. And what I found doing that kind of work was just how subjective a lot of archives are. You know, I'm, I was just like one person creating all of these different categories and organization, like subjective organizational, you know, strata for, for telling cultural stories. Um, and I think that really sparked a lot of interest um, for me in history um, creatively. Um, and, you know, I, but what I kind of quickly realized is that poetry for me, um, like theory, um, can make a lot of radical 
suggestions about how we see and perceive the world um, and also invites me to do it in ways that aren't necessarily conventional like you know when you think about if you're writing like a scholarly article you have to like you know do the rigorous citational which I you know as you can kind of tell with the appendix I still have like PTSD from my scholarly training and that like I am very meticulous about my citational practice um, but there's just certain ways that you have to um, do a scholarly article that um, I found poetry to be just as rigorous but perhaps a little more liberating in terms of making you know strong statements towards challenging how we view, perceive, and interact with the world. So um, it took me a really long time, but, and I think that the experience, my scholarly training is, is so important to who I am as a creative. And I haven't relinquished, if anything, I've, I've heightened those skills. But for me, I think it was just crucial for my development in terms of rethinking history and what I wanted to say, yeah. And I was reading an interview with you today and the term archive of harm came up. Um, and so I'm curious if you could talk some about archive of harm and the, the meaning of that and how that also fits in with the book. Yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, for better or for worse, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with archives, archive centered or um, around moments of violence, whether that be personal or whether that be national, historical, global, um, and the ways that we can't get out from under them. But also what I really appreciate about poetry is that um, you can represent a time that isn't necessarily bound to a form of kind of linear storytelling that invites um, easy consumption. Um, that invites, you know, uh, digestion and making you feel good about a certain thing. I, I like that poetry dwells in unknowing and relearning about a time or a place or a series of acts. Um, so I return again and again to the archive of harm and I can't not do that without poetry because I feel that poetry more so than other genres perhaps is a little more undoing, I guess, of the kind of e easier forms of storytelling that we tell ourselves about certain um, violent or traumatic acts. I, I want to um, invite people if they want, I do have the chat open. So just know that if you want to type in a question, you're welcome to do that and, and we'll read it out, um, out loud as well. Um, so I know you've lived a pretty international life. You lived uh, for a while in Seoul, South Korea. You lived in Madrid, Spain. Um, Zihuataneo, Mexico for a while, where I think you co-ran a backpacker's hostel. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also going to throw in there, like being born in California and now living in Jacksonville is, is, you know, a part of that wide range of living experiences as well. So I'm curious what role geography and maybe communication across geographical borders plays and um, not just how you write, but how you view your work in the world. Wow, that's a really good question. One that I haven't actually, I haven't, I haven't received that question before. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, being a Rolling Stone for several years maybe made me a little untethered in, in maybe negative ways, <laughs> but certainly ways that have inflected on my creativity. But you know, challenging the notion of a stable border, challenging the notion of, of of a place, right? Of how we know a place. Um, I guess my experience within a lot of these places is that it just really takes time to uncover their complexity. It takes time to learn a language. It takes time to learn about a person in a foreign language. And I guess, um, yeah, I think that that's really tethered to my interest in the sec, like the the second glance, you know, like looking, re-looking at, re-examining what we thought we kind of were familiar with, whether that be a place or a person or a nation or a story. Um, yeah, I think that that, that that deep kind of relationship to, to place and untethering is um, really important 
for that perspective. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, and there's, you know, the, I wanna use the word like control. Control plays such a big role in this book as well. And, you know, you've talked some about obviously uh, archives controlling a historical narrative of how we perceive all sorts of things, civilization really. Um, and then there's the, you know, what I'll call the smaller, lower C control, but like even something like the shoplifting and things like that that come into play throughout the book seems to have a sense of like retaking control by these almost like acts of, smaller acts of rebellion and so forth. And so, you know, and in that control is also a violence. You know, there's a, there's a looming sense of violence throughout the book that's very real, it's very palpable. It also makes sense, of course, with the Little Red Riding Hood narrative, which is, you know, steeped in, in the threat of violence as well. Um, so, you know, just as far as the book itself, um, I looked at it almost like not just um, documenting that control, those issues of violence and so forth, but maybe as its own means of survival um, and in some sense a survival manual even to pass along. Right, absolutely. Yeah, control is, and you know, I thought about that a lot with the Little Red Riding Hood iterations, like so much about it is about getting out, even if it was momentary to check out a flower or something, of getting out under the control of one's mother. I mean, my mother also a beautiful person, love her a lot, but she was very controlling in a lot of ways. Um, and that was also, that's kind of the underbelly, the thread of, of this book as well. But, you know, thinking about power and how um, it shape shifts throughout this, even to your point, the little C, like how to take it back. And even if it's kind of like in meaningless or minute ways of everyday existence, uh, I'm interested in those acts as being as being incredibly full of meaning and power, um, even if they're vexed or, you know, ethically wrong in some respects, to your point. Was your, I, I don't want to be too like nosy with this, but I'm curious, like, have you written about your mother before? And does she know like you're going to, particularly like the photos and things like that? It's, you know, there's two levels. There's the poems themselves and then there's the photos. And was that a discussion with her prior to the publication of the book? Yeah, I definitely, definitely asked her um, for permission and I explained it as best as I could. I asked her permission for the photos, certainly. I, um, has she read my work? I don't think so. <laughs> um, you know, she kind of gets a kick out of being on the cover of a book. But also, I mean, in, in the book itself, I'm, again, I, I want to be very clear that I don't want to co-opt this story. It's, it's my rendition of her, you know, which again is flawed and um, full of omission, um, which is kind of what I told her too. You know, it, it's, it's about my frame, um, however limited that is. Yeah, but she's, um, she was excited, she was, Excited, but kind of wary too that, um, so the story about the, the black and whites too, I mean, that involves the black and white photographs that involves um, this kind of pocket of photographs that she kept in the back of her closet that I had like snooped out and taken when I was really young, um, just, mm. you know, nosing around in her closet. And um, it, it's photographs of her and one of her first lovers um, in Vietnam, and it didn't work out. He was quite a wolf, but um, he had several wives. Uh, but uh, so that was like the incipient moment. And, it, you know, so that was kind of shrouded in secrecy. But when I was thinking about writing into this book, I, I remembered that booklet. And I was like, gosh, I got that, that, it. That's that. I still remember that, that I hadn't seen it. And, you know, over 20 years and I came back home and I was like, do you still have that little booklet? And um, and I explained to her that I really wanted to use it. And she was like, okay, you're, you're weird, but why not? <laughs> um, so it was kind of like a wary acceptance in that, you know, it's, it's like this thing that she kept in the back of her closet. Um, so it was a little bit shrouded in secrecy, but um, I tried to be as respectful as possible in terms of that frame. And again, to admit my own flaws and limitations in terms of how I, how I position it. 
Sure. And I mean, that's that's is always going to be inherently a part of not that this is memoir, but the memoiristic parts of, of this type of writing. It's like it, it's going to be subjective in that way. And um, so that's I guess that's just something that we have to accept and and, and know. But um, it's such a rich book in so many ways. I think, you know, poetically with the research, with with the images, the whole package is incredibly powerful. So thank you so much for sharing that with us and letting Boa publish it. I'm so happy that we did. And if you would be willing to leave us with one more poem, that would be wonderful. Yeah, thank I you, should. Jessica. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> and this is the last poem in the book. It's called Obad with Buffalo Girls in Flight. Forget the nighttime, forget the tumble and scourge. I didn't come here to sing silly songs. I was born into this day a buffalo. I will die one too. Violence is my pelt, my light fanged hoof. When I was a girl, I haunted men, took them apart in my day bed piece by piece, then went to go microwave another burrito. We aren't the worst of each day, surely. Don't paint this love a tragedy. Mother, I owe you my face. I owe you an uninterrupted life, which is to say I owe you nothing for what I left out of this catalog. Still, I owe you for tender volume or the way I never told you I cried after driving you home to the airport that year. Oh, final song of mercy, oh mercy me. I watched you disappear through sliding glass, my car's reflection snapping the flutter shut. How one could be vicious and still be love, still be kind, but never still. A crownless human in this rutted lake, the trace of this core that can't be fully excised by tongue, by cut, by mere deletion. How after so long in the wolf's maw, we remember how to get home how to grasp each other's earthly hands as we flee towards the woods and the hearth buried deep under the basket, the cloak, the fur. Against all odds, I think we'll find it there as we do each day, the indifferent sun. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jessica, for joining us tonight. And thank you to Peter as well for the conversation. Um, and thank you to all of you for attending the event. Um, for anyone who's interested in the book, the link is in the chat to pre-order it through Ampersand Books. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you so much again, Jessica, and best of luck with the book. Thank you. Thanks for listening, y'all.